Hello, I'm Rob Worden. My colleague Hannah Cochran is joining me today. We've been asked to talk a bit about community policing, which we're glad to do since it's a reform for which there is some solid evidence. And if you'll pardon me a moment, I'm going to find my PowerPoint. We'll discuss community policing generically, community policing in one city in which it was demonstrably effective, and community policing in Albany. Community policing is not a program to be appended to a department alongside its other operations, but rather a strategic innovation that calls for a reorientation of the police mission and associated changes throughout the agency such as in the distribution of authority through the chain of command and practices of recruitment, training, and supervision. It's generally thought to have three major elements. One is decentralization. The second is engagement with the community. And the third is problem solving or problem-oriented policing. And community policing is labor intensive, so it is not inexpensive. Mission reorientation means addressing community concerns and priorities. The previous police emphasis on more serious offenses in what has been called the reform era of policing gives way to attending to a broader range of public safety issues, especially fear of crime and disorder. Research in the 1970s and 80s showed that fear of crime is tied more closely to disorder than it is to crime. Some disorders are physical in nature, such as abandoned buildings, vacant lots, and graffiti. Other kinds of disorder are social, street level drug dealing, public drinking, and panhandling are examples. All of these disorders are conditions that residents experience day in and day out, and not only episodically, and they interpret them as signs of crime. They feel unsafe. And they look to the police for assistance in dealing with those disorders. Moreover, community policing goes beyond a focus on individual incidents in connection with which police are called for assistance and in response can devise only temporary solutions. Problem-oriented policing is designed to address underlying problems of which individual incidents are only symptoms. The breadth of the community policing role renders police, as Herman Goldstein said, an agency of municipal government housing a multitude of functions and not merely a law enforcement agency. It's worth considering problem-oriented policing a little further. In conventional incident-driven policing, police respond to and handle incidents one by one. Reports of burglaries, larcenies, or vandalism, disputes of many kinds, public disturbances, persons acting erratically, all of which may require the presence of the police. Problem-oriented policing does not replace but supplements handling individual incidents. Police and the community scan to identify problems that incidents represent and the conditions that contribute to or facilitate those incidents. They address not root causes that police can't change, but contributing factors that police can alter. It calls for analysis of the problems and then on that basis, action to address the conditions. Responses could involve enforcement, but also other kinds of interventions. A sterling example of problem-oriented policing comes from Gainesville that experienced an increase in convenience store robberies. As a result, they undertook an analysis finding that 96% of the convenience stores in Gainesville had been robbed in the preceding five years. They analyzed patterns of robbery events in incident report narratives. They interviewed incarcerated convenience store robbers. They found that 92% of convenience store robberies occurred with a single clerk on duty. And interviews with robbers indicated that they considered a second clerk a deterrent. And so the police recommended that the city council adopt an ordinance requiring two clerks on duty in convenience stores at night. After that was approved, in the following six months, convenience store robberies dropped by 65%. Now, problem-oriented policing applies not only to crime patterns like convenience store robberies, 
but to other neighborhood problems as well, including disorders. Not every problem-solving effort needs to be so extensive as the analysis of robberies in Gainesville, and they need not involve legislative action. They may involve enforcement, but often involve, in addition or instead, non-enforcement responses like that in Gainesville. One city that successfully implemented community policing was Chicago, with the Chicago Alternative Policing Strategy, introduced in 1993, initiated not by the police department, but by the mayor. And the mayor owned the initiative in that he took steps to ensure that other agencies coordinated with the police to address community concerns. That ensured a level of interagency cooperation that is not normal in many places. So when police heard that sanitation or public works needed to address an issue, it got passed on and done. Police engaged with the community in monthly beat meetings, as Chicago called them, in the 250 or so police beats there. They provided information to the community and also heard community concerns. And in Chicago, as elsewhere, community concerns were not con confined to serious crimes. The police department also affected over a period of time many other changes to support community policing. And a long-term comprehensive study of CAPS showed that it was largely successful. It found, for example, that physical disorder, as measured through the perceptions of surveyed residents, was down both in predominantly black and predominantly white neighborhoods. Those same surveys showed that social disorders of various kinds were down somewhat. It showed that fear of crime was down in many segments of the Chicago population. And finally, the analysis showed that attitudes toward the police improved as well. The evaluation showed that community policing can work when it is conceived and implemented properly. It's not easy, it's not quick, and it is not inexpensive. And as Chicago's experience shows, it cannot rest on police alone for other agencies have an important part to play, as does the community. Now it should be noted that CAPS failed for the most part in Hispanic beats where cultural and language barriers formed obstacles that were not overcome by 2004. And while CAPS was never, really, never formally discontinued, after 2004, it really shriveled due to changing executive priorities. And now Chicago is mounting a new community policing initiative modeled after NYPD's. But it goes to show that community policing requires ongoing administrative commitment and support. Now in Albany, community policing was reincarnated in 2010. Structurally, it revolves around community policing specialists in the neighborhood engagement unit, beat officers with stable assignments to relatively small beats. Team policing was added in 2013, intended to, as APD literature explains, identify and resolve neighborhood issues and problems. Support mechanisms for team policing were to include an information officer to facilitate information sharing and crime analysis support from the Crime Analysis Center to, and I'm quoting, assist in breaking down multiple problems and underlying causational factors. NEU officers have engaged in extensive outreach and community engagement through, for example, neighborhood association meetings, pop-up barbecues, and a variety of forms of youth engagement. Now, perhaps the best information on community policing in Albany comes from a class project conducted by a graduate course in 2018. It looked inside and outside of APD for evidence of forms that community policing took and officers and community members' perceptions. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to Hannah, who played a prominent part in that project. Thanks, Rob. So the goal of our project was to examine the perspectives of community policing in Albany from both practitioner and community vantage points, and more generally describe the organization and activities of the Neighborhood Engagement Unit, or the NEU. APD's community policing arm represents a multifaceted effort to provide more direct and personalized services to the community 
as well as to foster collaborative and team-oriented approaches to quality of life and crime concerns. Beyond that, Albany's NEU is significant in that it is largely representative of the agency's commitment to the public and of its efforts to create strong, well-grounded relationships with the communities it serves. So we conducted interviews and surveys with members of Albany's um, neighborhood associations, uh, which revealed mostly positive evaluations of the NEU's conduct and operations. Um, Rob, can we go to the next slide? The majority of respondents estimated that NEU was productive in addressing quality of life issues, building relationships, and reducing crime. A slight majority of respondents did note, however, that they rarely observed NEU officers on duty, and in an open-ended survey, they shared desires for an increased visibility of those officers. The members of the Business Improvement District likewise expressed positive opinions about community policing in Albany, however, also expressed a desire for increased invisibility of NEU officers. Through our interviews with the NEU officers themselves, we found high levels of support for the idea of community policing and for the NEU operations in which APD engage. Officers highlighted their unique ability to attend to problems that require sometimes daily attention, which might otherwise be a low priority for patrol, but nonetheless represent a significant nuisance to the community. The officers likewise noted the advantages of having personal relationships with members of the community and the open lines of communication that have been established within their beats, such as the introduction of a direct phone line to the assigned NEU officer. Additionally, officers assigned to NEU shared perceptions of improved police community relationships since the inception of the program. Interviews were also conducted with patrol officers who expressed positive attitudes to community policing um, and the NEU's offers efforts in general, but also expressed some frustration in the distribution of manpower given some stretched resources. Back to you, Rob. Thanks, Hannah. You know, some corroboration of officers' perceptions of community support can be found in survey data that we happen to collect at two points in time. In 2001, we conducted a survey of 900 Albany residents sampled from individual street blocks across the city. In 2014, we conducted a survey of 800 Albany residents sampled from various zip codes. In 2001, uh, responding to a question about satisfaction with police services in their neighborhoods, 80% of Albany residents indicated that they were very or at least somewhat satisfied with police services in their neighborhood. 37% indicating that they were very satisfied. By 2014, 88% indicated that they were very or somewhat satisfied and 53% were very satisfied. Now, we have to add as a caveat that uh, these are sample-based estimates subject to a margin of sampling error. They might over or understate the actual difference in the wider populations, but the point estimates of satisfaction indicate a positive change over those 13 years. And that positive change also holds among the subset of black residents in Albany. In 2001, 68% of black residents indicated that they were very or somewhat satisfied with police services in their neighborhood, 21% very satisfied. By 2014, 79% indicated that they were very or somewhat satisfied, and 30% of those were very satisfied. There is room for improvement, certainly, in Albany's community policing initiative. Patrol officers with whom the class spoke in 2018 were unaware of teen policing. Uh, by 2019, uh, with uh, rather widely um, uh, publicized incident on First Street, uh, an address that was associated with a use of force incident in March of 2019. 523 First Street is um, a, a problem that was a missed opportunity for problem oriented policing in Albany. According to an investigation uh, by APD, uh, between January of 2018 and August of 2019, that address attracted 55 calls for service 
a majority of which were for loud parties. And that's the kind of, um, of problem generating multiple incidents for which problem-oriented policing is uh, a well-designed kind of response. Now, we should bear in mind that uh, problem-oriented policing involves a rather steep learning curve for officers, reorienting from handling incidents one by one to addressing problems as constellations of incidents. And they said it's labor intensive. And uh, as of last week, Chief Hawkins reported that APD is down about 60 officers. But APD's Community Policing Initiative has a number of virtues. It is and will always be here and elsewhere a work in progress. We might mention that um, community policing can be thought of as procedural justice at the neighborhood level. The President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing identified uh, procedural justice as central to its first pillar of building trust and legitimacy. And community policing was its fourth pillar in their report. But community policing is procedural justice for the neighborhood. It gives the community voice, it accords respect to community priorities, and it reflects a concern for community well-being. And in addition, it is effective insofar as multifaceted responses to identified problems are more successful. It requires, we hasten to add, community involvement. The community has a very important part to play in co-producing community safety. That's all we have for today. Uh, thank you for your interest and for your attention.